Mick McCarthy has given tremendous service to, to Ireland. He's as a player, as a manager, 15 years plus um, in, the, in the limelight. Uh, back in 1986, when Jack Charlton took over and started building the team, um, Mick McCarthy was one of the, the main strengths of, of that team. Our, our, our central defence was built around Mick. Um, and, you know, a, a tremendous player, a tremendous heart. Uh, give huge encouragement to, to that team right through the, to the Charlton years and you know having been a, a tremendous uh, centre defender, a tremendous motivator uh, he, he then had the, the task of building a new team but he's done that um, and he's, he's given us just a, an unbelievable uh, few years now in, in the qualification. He's a very basic unassuming lad, knows his business, knows his job, works very hard and uh, he's, like I say, he's reaping the rewards now and not only am I delighted for him, everybody in Ireland is delighted for him. He's a, f a phenomenal man. Uh, he's done everything right in my eyes. Uh, the media's given him some, some stick, but, you know, he's not let that worry him. Uh, he's had belief in his players. He's been behind them 100%. He's given them everything that they've required to go out and perform at the levels that, that's needed. Uh, and you've got to see he got everything right throughout the campaign. Tehran, and the last step on the long road to the World Cup. Mick McCarthy's team had failed in playoffs twice before. And even with a two-goal advantage, the Irish were under siege. There was a late scare, but then the waiting was over. The joy of it, the Irish had achieved mission impossible. It began back in December 99 with what turned into a daunting draw for the Irish. The Republic of Ireland. Portugal. When I think back on Netherlands. Time. Cyprus, Estonia and Andorra completed the section, but from the start Mick was quietly confident. Look at the group, look where they'd just come from, European Championships, and nobody took us, nobody gave us a chance to even get anywhere near Holland and Portugal. I just thought that we'd, because of those feelings, because of the way people think, because of the way probably Holland and Portugal were thinking, and they'd just come off the back of European Championships, that we had a chance. I just thought we might be able to sneak in somewhere along the line. We've been doing well over the last four years, and uh, I think if people underestimate us, it certainly gives us an advantage. I pushed for the, I pushed for the away game first, uh, and Craig Brown was a great mate of mine. We've discussed a number of things and it, one of his was always get one of the top teams away from home first because if you do you go away and, even if you go away and get beat I know it's a bad start to the campaign but it's not like being at home and getting beat if you get beat at home you know like England did against Germany and wonderfully they've done well wonderfully well since to, to qualify but if you get beat in that first home game oh the, the, the atmosphere around the place then and uh, and the, the expectation level drops and people think you're out of the competition. Whereas if you lose in Holland or lose in Portugal, it's probably expected anyway, and you have a chance to turn it around with a, with a home game to come. So, you know, that was good advice from Craig, and uh, 
I took one. I didn't expect to get two, though. <laughs> we got Holland away, and then because the next one was Portugal away, so that was a bit of a surprise. So the toughest of starts for the Irish. But the opener set the tone for the campaign. Goals by Robbie Keane and Jason McAteer, earning a point in Holland. And in October, Matt Holland's precious goal meant a share of the spoils in Portugal. I think the important thing was that we, we didn't uh, lose either of those games. In fact, we should have beat Holland, no question about it. We were 2-0 up and played fantastically well for three quarters of the game and give away two goals near the end, maybe a bit of tired, tiredness set in. I mean, for 60 minutes we played them off the park, but then for 30 minutes we were getting played off the park as well. Uh, and they, they threw two or three substitutes on and uh, Seedorf came on and made a huge difference to the game. But they were, they were under the cosh, 2-0 down, they're throwing men forward and, and making it extremely difficult for us. I mean, they, they, their equaliser was a, a 30 yard deflect, a great strike, but he did take a deflection, he gave Alan Kelly no chance in the nets. So we came off delighted with 2 all. So when you look back you maybe think what might have been. I think we went to Portugal very, very confident about ourselves. Magnificent atmosphere that night. That was just one of those special days going into the ground and getting there and it was wonderful. Uh, but we were, we got an extreme amount of pressure in that first half. From what I remember, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. We'd been doing okay, but the way they were playing was causing us problems. And I remember at half time I took Quinny and put Matty Holland on to deal with that central area that was causing us such a problem. And it worked. I mean, it was a bit of a surprise that he got the equaliser, Matty, but it was more than welcome. With the hard work behind them, the Irish had to seize the initiative by winning their home games, starting with Estonia. Frank Stapleton and Rob Hawthorne were at Lansdowne Road. Green seems space to move into, and he's given Terrahoff the slip. It's his car. Kinsella. Roy Key! Good save. Kilbal on the follow-up. Kinsella will go to challenge Palmer, who's got all sorts of problems there. And Ryan gets it away. Carr. Ireland for a moment there sensed that Estonia had been weakened. And Keane brought the best out of the Derby goalkeeper. McAteer. Carr has advanced well. Quinn. Blocked by Stepanov. McAteer, Quinn, Roy Keane, and this time it's wide. Well, some wonderful football again from Ireland. Really, the confidence coming through from those two games. But really progressive stuff. Good cross in here from McAteer. Good hole of play by, by Niall, just on Roy's bad foot. This is Terrahoff. And he slipped it through to Zielinski, and space here for Zielinski, and Kelly manages to deny him. Ryan with the follow-up shot, but that was a real scare for Ireland. Hart. <laughs> Quinn. It's Kinsella! International cap brings the goal that he dearly, dearly wanted, and he's done it at Lansdowne Road. What a proud man he must be. Hart's corner delivered low. Quinn with a flick back. Done! A thumping strike from Richard Dunn gives him his second international goal. And Ireland are 2 0 up. And Niall Quinn has had a big part to play in both. Away from Alas. Away from Stepanov. Lacking support at the moment. Roy Keane and Quinn have got in there now, though, and Kilban has bided his time. Quinn! Oh, is it going to happen for him tonight? The question left hanging in the air. Well, I can't believe he missed this. I'm sitting here thinking, just, you just got to hit it, hit it down and put it in. Hart's corner. Green. 
taken. Salah! Oh, Keane! Robbie Keane stabbed it goalwards and Martin Ryan was in the right place at the right time. That's a fantastic save by Raheem on the line. Hart. Quinn's layoff. Foley. Roy Keane. He's gone for the blast. It's squirmed underneath Poem's body. Yeah, I think he really caught that one with the meat that time. He looked at his options. There was a, a chance on the right. But uh, for Finnan, but he, he really... Uh, Really caught the ball, the keeper got it in the second attempt. And the Republic of Ireland have really built on the confidence of their away points in Holland and Portugal. Mark Kinsella has got his first international goal. That's what set them on their way. And Richard Dunn added to it in the second half with his second goal at this level to now put the Republic of Ireland on five points and set them up well for when the World Cup qualifying programme resumes in Cyprus in March. Having achieved what we had against Holland and then Portugal, the two draws away from home, you know, the scene was set, the, the, the hype was starting already then, thinking, hey, we've got a chance here in this group. So Estonia were coming and everybody expects them just to lay down and, and die and get, and get spanked. But I'd, I'd watched them actually, I watched them play Portugal, after we played Holland I went to watch them, I knew they would be tough and resolute and fit and make it very difficult, which they did, but that night was, a, was it afternoon or evening, I can't remember, we played them both, it was, a, it was a, I thought, a really good professional performance against a team that, yes they came to defend, but they had a threat, the two strikers up front were a threat, pace, big and strong. Uh, and I thought we handled it very well and we picked them off and a 2-0 was as comfortable a 2-0 result as we've ever had and it could have been more uh, and that, that was one of, throughout the competition was as, as a pleasing a performance and a result as, uh, as any other I would say. So far so good for the Republic, mid-table after the opening few games. Portugal topped the pile after a fine victory in Holland but the real action lay ahead. After the break, we'll see how things panned out as Portugal came to Dublin. I've known Mick since I went to Sheffield Wednesday, and that would be, what, about 78, 79. And he lived in Barnsley, and he lived quite near me, and uh, we used to use the same pub. So we used to go and have a little game of dominoes on a Wednesday night. And we'd argue like hell over... 10p. Why did you play that one? Why? Should have played this one. And, uh, and then we played cards a little bit. This is the Kings. And... When Mick took over from Jack, for me it was the hardest job in football. You know, Jack was such a legend, uh, took us to three major championships. And Mick took over at a time when the players were getting a little bit older and he had to bring in some young blood uh, and phase the older players out gradually. And I think he'd done that particularly well. Uh, he gave the youngsters the experience that they needed. Okay, we, we took a, f a few defeats uh, along the way. We didn't qualify for any of the major championships purely because we lost in playoff finals. But he deserved his luck now because this campaign's been terrific. He was quietly confident that he could upset the Albuquerque because nobody really gave us a, a chance at it, Davy. And, and with the two big ones in Europe, Holland and Portugal, and, uh, but I think Mick thrives in that situation. Uh, he gets in there, let's go and see what we can do about, about uh, the situation. And uh, if we come out on top then, fantastic. Mick McCarthy, what he's done for sport in the country, and what he's done for morale, and, and you know, it, it gives people a great amount of self-esteem. It's been really terrific. With the Irish blooding new players, Mick was given the chance to try out some of the hopefuls in November. A friendly against Finland, the last game before a break until New Year. There's Ian Hart. Holland. This is Kinsella who scored his first international goal in the last game here. He's looking to provide a first international goal. Steve a remarkably speedy break, it's the new captain who set it up, but it's Steve Finnan who's got his first international goal in his fifth appearance for Ireland.
Polka picking up Johansson. Here's Lippmann and three in the box for him. Tainio. It's a good firm hit. Gillen kept his body behind him. Saruman. Lippmanen looking for Forsell. He retrieves it. Oh, what a drive that was! Fantastic effort. Polka was the man who hit it and really rattled Gibbons' goal break. Well, there was no indication it is coming. Good hold of play by Forsell, but he lost the ball. But then retrieved it. What a strike by Polka. Where Ireland need a touch of uh, quality from the delivery, and it's been left for Steve Staunton to organise himself. Ah! A thumping drive from him, well matched by the save. Here comes Robbie Keane, now McAteer. What a header, and what a goal! And Kevin Kilban, like Steve Finnan before him tonight, scores his first international goal. Oh, what a fantastic cross this is. And what a finish. The goalkeeper had no chance. Great ball from McAteer, whipped in. And Kilban used all of his height there, all of his power. This is Coochie. And he's driven it across, and they can't even get a consolation goal. Catilla steering it back across. McAteer. Obstructed by Milland. Staunton! What a way to round it off! on his 86th appearance for the Republic of Ireland gets his seventh international goal of what a cracker well again a little touch to the side and did he wallop it the goalkeeper no chance he saw it coming but there was nothing he could have done about it that ball started at least two feet outside the far post and it was the very last kick of the game there wasn't even time to kick off again I have to be honest I think 3-0 it was a bit of an injustice to, to, to Finland and, uh, and flattered us a little bit. But it, it helped us to continue that winning run and that, that, well, that mentality of not being beaten, certainly. Uh, and even looking back to when we were in, in the US, the US Cup, that summer, unbeaten, unbeaten, Holland, unbeaten, Portugal, unbeaten, Finland at home, a great victory it looked like, you know, 3-0. So it just it kept us on a roll, which was, it was a great game for us because of that. With another couple of away qualifiers looming, the Republic arranged a home friendly against Denmark, but the weather beat everyone. And even then, the Irish boss took a positive from the week. It wasn't fit to play. You know, we, we were both out there, and uh, the two of us, the two coaches, uh, Martin Olsen was out there, and, uh, and myself, and uh, it wasn't fit to play. No, no question, no fit to play. But they had got their full strength team out of Denmark and we had got a number of injuries and people missing and I just, I, I th it was one of those days I think we could have got beat at home playing against a full strength Danish team, or a Danish side of a very good side and to, looking back on it that being cancelled I think was a, a good decision maybe even a, you know, not a turning point because we were doing well but it could have been a turning point had we played them and got beaten with a a weakened side, it could have just have affected our, our confidence and it just turned out to be a good decision not playing that. Into March and the Irish were back in action. Another two away games. Roy Keane was inspired and he scored twice as the Irish strolled past Cyprus. And then a win in Andorra to put the Republic top of the group. Although they made hard work of it. Always pleasing to win football matches. I think uh, the Cyprus game especially 
It was very pleasing. That was a good performance. That was the potential banana skin, that one. Cyprus away. They actually moved their game from the, the ground they normally play at. And they seemed to, afterwards, weren't happy. Because we beat them. Convincingly, the result looked 4-0, but it was, the game was tougher than that. But I thought that was a very, very professional performance. That was a good performance. Terrific result, because that was a tricky fixture. We didn't know what to expect going away there. You're going into, you know, always a tricky place, maybe because of conditions, because it, but, but to be fair to Cyprus, they had a fabulous stadium out there. Beautiful pitch. Which was uh, which was nice because we didn't we expected maybe it not to be as good, uh, and we won very very comfortably indeed. It wasn't just a victory for Ireland; it was a victory for the shop floor as well, wasn't it? Because Roy <laughs> Keane, having complained about the players travelling economy <laughs> class, uh, he got his way, didn't he? I wish he had a complaint when I was playing. <laughs> <laughs> we might have travelled first class a few times. He did eventually when he went to Tehran in the playoffs. They were all up front first class, and that, rightly so. That's to, that's where he should be, and and it takes somebody of maybe Roy stature to make that little bit of complaint. But I think that was down to Mick too, you know, and uh, between the two of them, they had sorted that out. That one out and. They'll be going to the World Cup now and they'll be off flying first class. Andorra away, well, they just sat back and 11 men, common breakers down, which we knew it was going to be. We had a number of injuries uh, prior to that game and I seem to remember Dave Connolly and Robbie Keane playing up front and uh, we, were not, we were not getting too much joy there because we had no aerial threat. And it, and it was, I suppose it's kind of sad really, but we had to play that way and put the ball up at Gary Doherty on and we nicked a goal then almost immediately, for I think we got a penalty. Uh, goal difference it came down to our group, and I think the, because we didn't score as many as against Andorra as perhaps we could have done, or should have done, you know, probably cost us a little bit, but it's a victory, three points you want. And it was the Andorans who were next visitors to a rain-soaked Lansdowne Road. And again, the Irish didn't make it easy for themselves against one of Europe's weakest teams. Here's Doherty, and pushed away this time only to Kennedy, and as Doherty tries to follow it up, Ireland see another opportunity go begging. It's Ruiz with a free kick, and that's a testing header, oh. oh what a shocker, Ildefons Lima has scored. And what a start for Andorra here, past the half-hour mark. Not only have they soaked up everything that Ireland had thrown at them, they've scored only their fourth goal in this qualifying campaign. Holland. Doherty with the head of Ankerman. It hasn't taken them long, but it was a much-needed goal to equalise. And Kevin Kilbane, who scored against Andorra in Barcelona, Scores against them again. Well, this is a great ball in. Great run by Coban, and what a lovely touch from Gary. Gary Doherty, great finish by Coban. But uh, they needed to get it back quickly. Lovely touch off his head, and he slammed it into the corner. Kelly. Kennedy. Coban's left it. Doherty with a header. The other side of the ball, but Kinsella thumps it in. Now it's starting to flow, and now they're starting to enjoy it a bit more. A oh, good individual work here by Kennedy, beat his man. Doherty knew what he was doing, beat the goalkeeper, hit the defender, and Kinsella finished with a bomb. Four in the middle, Doherty's one of them, good save! And Kennedy can't get there quickly enough for the rebound. Doherty doing all he can to score. Hart's taken it and they've gone to sleep there, it's Kinsella! And uh, Sanchez's reactions can't be questioned there. Kelly trying to get around the outside of Jimenez and Holland and Connolly got in each other's way. Hart! Thundering drive just over. Well, Ireland came into this match as uh, leaders of Group 2, a position they'll maintain by winning. 
Kinsella! And the goalkeeper at full stretch, getting a vital touch. Kinsella's left it for Hart to take. And it's a put down. And it's a straightforward goal for Gary Breen. On the first time that he's captain Ireland in Dublin. Gary Breen celebrates the moment with a goal and eases the tension. Well, the keeper was bound to get cut out. Under pressure, went the punch. Breen just had to lift the ball and make sure he hit the target. Can 3-1 become 4-1? Can certainly pack a punch in Hart. Oh, and he's so unlucky there. It's the width of the crossbar that saves Andorra. To be fair, they scored a fantastic goal. If we'd scored it from a corner kick, great header. And I remember looking at the clock with about 30, 35 minutes gone and uh, the sign said Republic of Ireland nil, Andorra won. It wasn't a pretty sight. But we, to be fair, the, and the players reacted in the right way, the positive way, and, and we got straight back into it. Unfortunately we did because it would have been difficult had it gone any longer. And I think we went in 2-1 up then at half time, which... Uh, Made for a far better team talk at halftime. But the Republic were in control of the group. Holland lay second, level on points with Portugal, the next visitors to Lansdowne Road. What was the biggest surprise for me is how many different names there were on the Portuguese team sheet. Players I didn't know. And um, we'd watch them, I'd have video tapes and got, the, got all the team sheets. Players who hadn't played for a while. And they came out, they were, they were terrific. Again, you know, it was sort of got us on the back foot, I think, for what, 10, 15, 20 minutes we were defending. We'd got a new defensive partnership, Steve Staunton and, and Richard Dunn. Uh, and a lot was made of that, and I don't think that, I actually thought they defended very well. What we didn't do, we didn't pass the ball very well. The, the, the chances that Portugal got came from our inability to pass it and to keep hold of possession. And getting close to Luis Figo. Goes on Figo finding some room for himself and looking at Raul Palata. Figo already showing what a danger he will be if he can get through. Well, we talked about before the match about him coming inside, played a fantastic one too. The party was close down into the corner. Luis Figo over the free kick for Portugal and he's bent one in. Just sails over. Kinsella. Litosh and Paletta here is onside. Staunton has to get back to him. Well, he's held him up, but he's got support. It's Rui Costa. Oh, thundering shot. He's there again. And what a weak follow-up. A thunderous effort the first time that rattled the goal frame, but what a disappointing follow-up for the rebound. Luis Figo's kick, away by Staunton this time. Back across by Petit, Carr clears. Carletta with the drive, and tipped away well by Shea Gibbon. Yeah, what a strike this is by Carletta. Comes inside, he's hit it. The head of the win, it's gone in the top corner. Fantastic save by Shea Given. Staunton. The header goes straight to the danger man, Rui Costa, who's got Barbosa now moving out to his left. Pedro Barbosa, and it's reached by Letta. Oh, it's a great chance, and Dunn will be so pleased that he missed that opportunity because Dunn left the cross. And this centre-back partnership is just getting pulled all over the place. Steve Stone caught on the back foot. Paletta really should have scored. And somebody's looking down on us today because this is an absolute sitter. There was a, there was a, a strong wind in that game as well, I remember, that, that was at the back of the Portuguese. And we found it so difficult to get out of our half. And I have to be honest, we, I thought we got to grips with the game after about 30 minutes and, and we settled down. But I was glad to see half-time. And I'd contemplated some changes, but 
understanding the circumstances and, and the conditions that were, I fancied us setting down with a wind behind us and we'd settle down, we'd started to play some stuff that we would, we would cope with it and it proved to be. Costa. Rui George. Car gets in the way. Ireland get the throw. And Roy Keane gets forward. Roy Keane, yes! It's deflected on its way through for the second half transformation. Pays dividends for Ireland with a goal. And that captain has played a real captain's part. Oh, this is it. Again, from a throw-in, a best opportunity in the first half. First touch, back off the defenders, backside, and doesn't matter if they go in. But that has lifted the, the roof of the stadium here. Everybody's gone absolutely mad. We took the lead, and then, of course, they, st <laughs> they start throwing substitutes. I forget who comes on. The Capuccio comes on. They've got... Uh, Gomez on, they've got Joel Pinto on, they've got Figo on, they've got Rui Costa on and, and I forget the subs they're putting on but seem, every sub that seems to be going it seems to look like another five or six million pound player that's coming on, even more and they had a, they had a strike force on to die for at that stage and, and then they got hold of the game and of course Figo who in my mind is one of the world's best footballers got into the far, stoke, far stick and equalised and I think uh, we held on for a while there, but I think we were worthy of a point, certainly. But it was a fantastic game. Great game of football, that. Costa to Petit. Portugal will keep probing away. Figo has given Holland the slip. Luis Figo. João Pinto. Locked well by Kilban. Can Fresho get it back across? He can! Figo's in there! but he's broken Irish hearts Luis Figo gets the equaliser well he just had a feeling it was coming Ireland lad, dogged defending but too many men on that right hand side and he comes in and to be fair to him he's put his head there and it's a great header into the top corner and he started off the move kept on there but it's uh, Ireland really give the initiative back to Portugal they've got nobody up front and the ball's just keeps coming back and eventually something is going to happen. All credit to Luis Figo in there where it hurts, a great header. Petit. Now Jao Pinto. In these worrying times for Ireland, Portugal starting to get a grip again. Great move, Jao Pinto. Four days later, the trip to Tallinn. No slip-ups, a job well done. The Irish returning with the points. Goals by Richard Dunn and Matt Holland. And now the excitement was beginning to build. Each and every game was, this is the biggest game Ireland have played, the most important game. But I think we, th we thrive on that, it's fantastic. You know, it's a great position to be in. When consider what people thought about before the group started. And it's another of those big games after the break, as the Dutch come to Dublin. And Mick's done a magnificent job with him. I mean, he's, uh, he's, he had a few of the players left when I was there, uh, who were getting a little bit older, who were going to go out within his time. But he's replaced them with young lads who are coming through, very, very mobile people, good players and worked very, very hard for him. And he's, uh, he's reaped the rewards of five years' hard work. Mick has done a, a wonderful, wonderful job. And you know, the interesting thing about us from, from the national team, uh, you know, in 15, 16 years, just two managers, 
uh, one, one resigning, another there. I mean, I think we're loyal to our managers. Our loyal have been very, been, our managers have been very loyal to the country. Uh, they, they do a great job, and, and Mick McCarthy is a great person. I, 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 I wouldn't know him on a huge friendship basis, but I know him quite well. Uh, I'm very proud of him. I'm very proud of what he's done for this country. A friendly against Croatia gave Mick McCarthy the perfect chance to prepare for the crunch game in the group against the Dutch a few weeks later. Reed, way by Tudor to Gary Kelly, Robbie Keane, Roy Keane, good play this from Ireland, Duff, storming goal, wonderful build up, a bullet of a finish and Ireland are ahead. Great touch here by Robbie Keane, into Roy Keane. Duff goes, comes inside, and what a finish that is, right in the corner. Goalkeeper's no chance. Great move, but the fact that Mark Quinn is not there makes Ireland have to play the ball to feet, and this boy is just on fire. And a good clearing header by Kelly as Tudor got forward. And that header is over by Stanich. Well, almost an equaliser there on two occasions. This is the cross coming in, the header cleared off the line by Kelly. Here's Vugrinets for Croatia. Christian getting forward to join the attack and Kelly going down to deny it. This is McPhail. Carsley. Connolly. It's a dream come true for the Crystal Palace striker. After a couple of under-21 appearances, he scores for the senior side. This is great play from David. What a great ball through to McIntyre. Great save by the keeper. Well, look at that with an easier goal in the international debut, but we won't mind. Well play, Jason McIntyre and David Connolly. Trojanetsky looking for... Davos Shuker. This jam with the cross. Vugrinets with a header. Oh, the fine goal. And they have got one back. It's the substitute. Vugrinets, double Vugrinets. This is a fine cross by Biscan. And he placed that beautiful place. Header down into the bottom corner. But the goalkeeper can't get to it. And that's a replay from Croatia. Fine header into the corner. Tudor going for it. And there was a handball the referee saw in there, and he's given the penalty, has he? He has. And yes. all the Croatian players have called for it. Difficult to see from this angle. Here we go. Oh, it was John O'Shea, he put his arm out. I think he got his, his body the wrong way round. Well, this is... Well, for Ireland. It's a tragedy, it's after all the game. Really looked like they were going to win it. Can Alan Kelly stop that or shoot air? No, he can't. Croatia get the injury time equaliser. Davos Shuka, the scorer. Yeah. Well, an excellent penalty. Enough pace. Alan guessed the right way, but there was too much pace on the shot. To say. Not too often he does miss from there. It was a good performance. I thought we played well. And to be honest, I, I, I diluted the side in the second half. I think we had seven substitutes. Five, so, five, six you know. substitutes yeah. so when you consider that, and you know, that is, some people over in, at home now in Ireland would be saying, because we drew, we conceded goals in the last minute. Oh, woe is me, and we're back to conceding goals. You had to look at the substitution that went on, the substitution that were made from both teams. And the game was sort of, de not, not devalued is probably the wrong word, but it was not as important 
they were doing exactly the same. They put a lot of substitutes on. And it turned out to be, it was a great game of football. And I think we both got bits out of it in terms of individual performances. And it was a good, it was a good preparation game for our next match, which was against Holland, of course. But more significant that day for me was the fact that England had played Holland. You talk about significant things, I'm talking about the significance of us not playing Denmark that time. The significance of that England game was incredible to me. I, I, I sat and watched that afterwards and I was thrilled and delighted that England had been beaten. That sounds wrong. Not so sounds much because bad. England were beaten, you're qualified. Listen to that. what I'm going to say, yeah. yeah. I wasn't thrilled that England beat beaten because I'm not, you know. I, I was delighted England qualified along with us and uh, oh, we along with them because we were be behind them and delighted for Sven because he's a lovely guy. But the manner in which the game had been played, Holland I knew would come to us rubbing the hands and full of that you know, Dutch confidence and bordering on arrogance that we're just going to turn us over and that's what happened. And I was laughing my side sore at that game because nobody had made a tackle. I think Nicky Butt made the first, was it Nicky Butt, made the, or, or Scholes was it, made the first tackle. It was about 30 minutes gone in the game. I thought it was, an, it was a non-event, and it, it was incredible the way it was portrayed as Holland's best performance and a wonderful performance against the, an England side, and, and Sven changed the side in the second half. They put two teams out almost. So I, I thought, you're talking about our game against Croatia being a bit diluted and not as significant of, of any importance. That game to England wasn't of any importance, but to me it was massive importance, and it proved to be. Because I said, if they think they're going to come, I said in the press, and I probably said to you before, before the game, if Holland think they're going to come to Lansdowne Road, and the first tackle will be made in the 30th minute, then there's a rude awakening coming. So going into the decisive game, the Republic were on top, and Holland four points adrift. A small nation with big dreams, united by football, chasing the game's greatest prize. For Mick McCarthy's men, the dream was now within reach, but the mighty Dutch stood in their way. That was do or die that game against Holland because if Holland won that that match with their superior goal difference, I think they would have went on to get that second spot. But once again, our battling qualities come to the fore. We felt that Holland we were capable of beating them, and we showed a way to them, a way out in, in, in Holland that, that we were capable of going out there and beating them, and we had that confidence within us. Um, and, and that was the message he was given across to the players. You know, you can say one thing to the press and everybody else, and, and that, but within that dressing room. He was telling those players that we can go and beat this team, no doubt about that. They've got probably the strongest team that day. Uh, every one of them was there, bar David. Maybe you could count him in as one of the guys that missed out. But um, really, the, uh, you know, above anybody in Europe should be able to come to Lansdowne Road and give us a bit of a hiding, but I think it was the other way around, David. They had to win. Because a draw for us and then beat Cyprus, <laughs> to the maths, we, we would have qualified. We'd have got into the playoffs. So Holland had to come and beat us. Now, for all they want to come with a bravado and what they're going to do, any team, to Lansdowne Road, I just said, have a look at the history of Lansdowne Road. We're not being beaten there in a, in a qualifying game. Not in the last six years. Six years, yeah. It's had been there. So any team that can come to Lansdowne Road with supreme confidence they're going to turn us over, I think it's a little bit misplaced. You know, and... Uh, I think we've every right to feel comfortable and confident playing against anybody at Lansdowne Road because of our record. Uh, but it was a, a pivotal game. I seem to remember saying, you know, yeah, you know, passionate hearts but calm heads. Because getting wound up and going around tackling and closing them down, that's one thing, but then you've got to be able to you've got to be able to switch from one to the other. Then you need to be able to calm down and pass it and play our game and keep the ball off them and create chances. And uh, 
It worked. We were certainly passionate, but we played some good football as well. I was in bits before, not in bits before the game, but the hairs on my neck, my arms, I had goose pimples. I can't, it wasn't cold. And I had a lump in my throat. It was just amazing, just the atmosphere. And then when the national anthem was sung, never before have I heard that. It was fabulous. It really was. One big talking point in team selection. Robbie Keane and Damien Duff paired in attack. Duff would have been playing well uh, in the games. Game was against uh, Portugal, played against Estonia. He was absolutely electric in training that week. And uh, it transpires after the game that somebody said, Stammer in his book had said that he preferred to play against big fellas than little fellas. And that I must have read his book. I mean, that's complete gobbledygook, that. I seem to remember me being a big, uncompromising centre-half myself. Uh, and believe me, I'd much sooner play against Quinney, week in, week out, than Damien Duff or Robbie Keane. And that's not been knocking the big fellas in any shape or form, it just suits us. What you don't want is little fellas running up the side of you and spinning in channels and turning and running at you. And I'd seen, I'd seen Stamp play for Manchester United against Fulham and Lewis Ahar tore him asunder up the side of him on a couple of occasions and I just thought it was my best option. Holland then who haven't missed the finals of a World Cup tournament since 1986. Their hopes in this tournament hanging by a thread and they really do need to win here today. But the Irish can't afford to have the mentality of looking for a draw and Kevin Kilban getting into the mix early on. Here's Mark Overmars, getting in tight to him is Roy Keane, leaving an early mark on the man with whom he used to be in competition in uh, Overmars' Arsenal days. Clive up there getting involved in a situation that really had nothing to do with him. But Helmut Krug is already issuing a stern warning to Roy Keane. There's a tackle from Roy Keane, I think on, uh, was it on Overmars? probably on a couple of them, but yeah, there, were, there was a tackle early on that sort of, you know, you see one player doing that and it sort of br it gets everybody bristling thinking, you know, and a great tackle, it lifted the crowd. And Cliven here has won it from Kelly, here's a great chance! have been a nightmare start for the Irish and how grateful they are that Clivert has missed that opening. Well, this is an absolute disaster for Gary Kelly so early in the game and what a miss from Clivert. He really should have put that away and we've got off the hook there. We gave it away at the back and uh, it, it straight to Clivert's feet and he's through and you know I watch him on the box here and Week in, week out, he slots them in the net, and uh, thank goodness he didn't. He missed it. He missed it by must have been millimeters. It scraped the post, I think. And everybody, found, I mean, the, the, I, I think if you get that on tape, there might be a, a silence there when he gets that ball and picks it up. You know, when we were watching, it appears to be it's in slow motion almost. It goes through. He expected to go in the net, and it doesn't. <sighs> you know, big sigh of relief from all of us. But that seemed to wake us up because we uh, we picked our performance up from then certainly. Robbie Keane. It's been 
a nervous start to this game by Ireland and Gibbons kick is going to come straight back at him here from Van Bommel I think we've got to get more of a competitive edge into our game we've got to, you know, we want to play football but this is from our goal kick he's running straight at the back foot gets a shot at target away goes uh, Damien Duff keen ops to stay in the penalty area McAteer and Holland trying to get forward in support. Here's McAteer. Now Kilban. Robbie Keane. Now that looked to be a push in the back. And the uh, Irish striker feels that the assistant referee should have seen that. This is a fantastic move. Best movement of the, of the game for Ireland. Just a little nudge in the back. And if he'd have missed the ball, I think he might have had the grounds for it. A penalty, but he actually made contact very much the referee could have done in that situation. Mark Overmars. Free kick given away by Gary Kelly and a yellow card for the Leeds man. Mm, this is a silly tackle, isn't it? Tackle from behind. And it had been worn before. Getting a little bit frustrated. Just take it easy, guys. He's, now he's put himself in a difficult position because Overmars were looking to run at him even more now. Tendon sweeps in the kick. And Van Nistelrooy couldn't provide a finishing touch to it. How did that one get away? This is fantastic pace by Zenden. And everybody missed it. it. Just got a flick on the near post. I think it was an Irish head, yeah, it was Matt Holland, and then Mr. Roy couldn't believe that the ball was in front of him. Duff. The game has been very scrappy, hasn't it, for about 20, 25 minutes. But um, I think Ireland will feel that they've uh, battled their way back, very lucky not to be at least two goals down in the early part of the game. But since then, it's, there's not really been much happening, and it's mainly been down to Irish mistakes that they've uh, that they've actually got their chances. But all square then at half time, stalemate, no goals. Ireland recovering from a nervous start, and they could have got a goal down after Gary Kelly's mistake they almost put Clive up through, but he shot wide. Ireland have settled themselves. Finish the first half stronger. And after the break, we relive a momentous second half. Nick was our captain when we went to the first World Cup finals in 1990. Captain Fantastic, I think they called him. And, um, he, he, that kind of label, but now you know he's he's gone on and he's done another job. Now he's brought the country there as a manager. Um, I'm not so sure he'll uh, be pinned up in all the kitchens, like all the housewives had Jack Charlton and the Pope and all that in, in their houses there for years. I'm not so sure he'll do that, but at the same time he'll, uh, well he has done. He, he's made a huge impact on the people because they've seen honesty, hard work, endeavour, um, and he's he's started as we said, like you know from scratch and brought the thing right full circle around to the to the very top again. Being one of the older players now. Um, I've, you know, it's, it's been an absolute joy to play with the likes of Robbie Keane and Ian Hart and Gary Breen, Lee Carsley, these kind of players. Um, so for me, I mean, it was great. It was great getting on the back end of, of the last World Cup, the '94. I sort of sneaked in the back door with Jack, and I didn't really, although it was great for me to go and everything, I didn't really grasp what what it, the true meaning was. Um, but this time, I've, I've been right through the campaign, um, and you really. It's a great sense of achievement, you know, and for me, personally, I'm just so made up that, that, that Mick's going, he's got his team there, and the likes of Robbie Keane are going to show his talents, Ian Hart and Dave Connolly, they're going to show their talents on a world stage, because that's, you know, there's no better place to do it, um, and it'd be a great experience, it's something that um, we'll, we'll never forget. Nil-nil at half-time, between the Republic of Ireland and Holland, and the real drama was about to unfold. Koku just getting a warning after that uh, challenge on Roy Keane. The 
surely not going to have a shot in here. This is 40 yards out. It's a long way out, but what will the wind do to it? Oh! It's a fantastic effort. I just can't believe he's going to take a chance, but he's got it on target, so it would have been would have something really exceptional now for Van der Sar to, to let that one in. Here's Zenden. He's tricked his way past Hart. Now can Kilban cover? He can. Good challenge. Hart. Roy Keane. Kilban gets himself out of trouble this time. But then Hart plays Ireland back into difficulties. Zenden back to Patrick Kleibert. Koku with the strike. Van Nistelrooy. With dicing with danger then. I wonder if the time might be right for Mick McCarthy to contemplate uh, a change. Niall Quinn has been sent to warm up. I think that would give the crowd a lift as well. I think we just need the pace of the game to be quicker. And this seems to be up to a point. And we're putting an extra. Oh, he's he's going to get himself sent off doing this. Yeah, he's off. Oh dear. Gary Kelly has already been booked, he's shown a second yellow card and he's off for that challenge on Mark Overmars. Ireland are down to ten men. Well, Mick McCarthy, who was possibly planning a change anyway, will now have to reorganise one man light. We were doing fine. So we'd, we'd second half has started a bit of a bit of a non-event but you know for me that was fine I know we're the home side but they're not causing us any problems the multi-talented multi-million pound strike force that is that was against us weren't really opening us up and causing us problems so I was fine I was happy enough uh, unfortunately Gaz had he'd, he'd remembered the he'd remembered the passionate hearts and not the calm head speech a bit <laughs> he'd remembered the first bit not the second bit but you know I, I have to be honest now it's uh, it's there, but for the grace of God, go I, that kind of thing. He went in trying to win the ball. Uh, Overmars had been causing him problems. I thought his first booking was a bit... Mm. Certainly weaker than the second yeah, one. Yeah, but the second one was a booking. It's, yeah. you know, no question, it's the second yellow card and he has to go off. But uh, then I made the substitution, I brought Steve... I mean, what goes through your mind at that point then? 1-0 against Holland, but the talent there and, and the way the game was, was going, and you're thinking, well... It's not like 50 minutes ago you've got a man sent off. They were talking about 32 Sorry, minutes. I, I don't think I did it, but I think, I think it's... <coughs> oh, no. <laughs> Here we go. One of them, was it? Well, it, but it was like for a split second, you think, oh, you know. And then it's, well, come on, like, what can we do about it? You know, let's, let's sort it out. Let's get 4-4-1. Four, four, and decisions are made there. And then I was still talking to, to Ian Evans, who... Uh, to Taffers. He's known and loved throughout. He... Uh, just discussing it with him, I don't know if I was stood up there having a chat at the time or maybe I went up and I said look we've got to get 4-4-1 four, four, and you know we, we just chewed it for a couple of seconds and decided that Stevie Finnan would go on and it was one of the two of them coming off Robbie Keane or, or Damien Duff uh, and Robbie you know we've relied heavily on him a lot on his young shoulders we've put a lot of responsibility on him but uh, he was the one to come off I think purely and simply because Damien, well Damien does, he has real blistering pace to be fair and he, he could stretch them in, in a way as Robbie's a bit more quick feet and in and around the box. And I also remember the crowd's reaction that particular day when Gary got sent off, they actually uh, really responded in the right, f the right way because normally at Lansdowne Road people do sit down and, and you've been there yourself and uh, that particular day I've never experienced an atmosphere like it. it was quite incredible and when he got sent off we probably had another 25 minutes of play in that game back to the wall but the incredible thing that happened in that game you expect Holland to really, really knock the ball around cut you up especially with, with, with an extra man but he didn't if you think 10 men against the Dutch they'll now pick holes in us you know yeah we're going 4-4-1 four, four, we do it in training all the time we play 11 against 8 and it's, tell you what, it's difficult to score if, if you're that frame of mind I talked about Andorra if you're in with that mindset and you know you make a few challenges and they're finding it difficult, the longer it goes, you get into it where it, it, you know you're not going to let them score. You know, there's that bloody mindedness, that determination. Of course, the opposition are thinking, we don't beat ten men. It, it, the pressure's on them. 
But what happened next? <laughs> Roy Keane. Good play from Keane. And here's Damien Duff. Good advantage played this time by the referee. Finnan. Got to try and shrug off Koku somehow. Duff misses. McIntyre with a chance. The Dutch fans can't. An eruption of joy all around Lansdowne Road. Oh, Finland does well here. Just clips the ball and it goes out past everybody. And there's Jason Magatier, side footed, took his time. And can you believe it, Ireland? They're in the lead. Jason Magatier at that particular time didn't even have a club. He was at. You know, he, he was with his own side at, at that Blackburn, but you know they didn't really want him. They said that he could go on a transfer, uh, and he went out and he performed like the way he did. And, the, and to get the goal at that particular time with ten men showed all our qualities. I was delighted for Jason because Jason was one of those players that been out of a team over in England, Blackburn, struggling to play, but always came over to Ireland and really done the business for Mick. And I think that was Mick's exceptional management. They done that for Jason. Always made him feel feel part of it, put his arm around him when he needed it, and give him the confidence. And I was delighted for Jason that day. For the away game at Howland, uh, I was in that the Blackburn team. And the home game, I wasn't even in the in featuring in the squad of Blackburn, so he stood by me then. Um, and on the day it come good for me, I managed to, to get a goal in either game um, and it, it helped me in the end to, to uh, get a move to Sunderland so um, you know, I've got to thank him for that but also for me, um, Mick McCarthy's been a good friend you know, um, you know, a lot of people don't, don't, don't realise you know, with footballers they do have problems outside of the game you know, we're just like everyone else um, you know, when we have problems he's always been there for me he's always been on the first, on the phone um, through the good times and the bad times. I've talked to Jason and, and right from the first game in Holland when, when he scored with a great left footer was to don't be stuck out on the right wing, go and play off the front man. Especially if it's, be, if it's being played up the left side and it's coming into the front or through the middle, don't be just stuck out wide right, go and link up off the front man. Can you get in? Can you go and get a shot in? Can you get in the box and score? But not from the left wing position, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how that happened. But he's such He's a, such a fit lad, but such a willing runner, such a willing worker. Sometimes, to his detriment, because he grafts so hard that then he, he's, he's tracking back and he's he's breathing heavy. But he, he was in. I said Stevie Finnan. Guess what? I think we'd won it. Roy Keane has the ball. I think we won a tackle, and it, he's, we we keep in possession as much as anything. Whenever we've got the ball, rather than attack them and give possession back to them, we're trying to be methodical and, and, and build up gradually and keep hold of it. And we'd done it for a, a short while there. You know, no better to keep hold of possession than Roy. And I think he'd come through a couple of tackles and stuck Stevie Finnan in, who, because Jason's gone, he's, he's the right back, he's up on his up attacking. Seems to me he went across, he, he got stopped, and he turns back on his left foot and gets a cross in. Uh, one of their players, I think, flicked it. I think Duffer, Damien, was Duffer's waiting for it. Duffer was with Stam at that yeah, point. Duffer's yeah, Duffer's waiting for it, but he got flicked over everybody, and it was there but the bowl, Jason. And I mean, it wasn't an easy chance, bouncing up to him, and you don't know what you think. It's popped to him. You think, go and have a touch, put it in the net, and he just he swept it in the net, and it was just well, it was a fantastic finish, worthy of any of the best strikers in the world. That the way he finished it. And we know what happened, the place erupted, it was just amazing. Well, emotions are running high, you know. You think from starting off against Holland the previous year, and then coming through all that we've come through, different things, and you get to a stage that we're in needing to draw against Holland, and we expect to beat Cyprus at home, and we'll be in the playoffs, which nobody gives a chance. Here we are, we're ten men, and nil-nil against Holland. We're all you know, wound up like, you know, clocks, we're like, you know, piano wire on, on that bench, all tight. And it's an amazing relief when you see that ball going, but then instantly you think, whoa, hold on a minute, get back, get settled, get your shape back again, and uh, try and keep them out, because I don't know what was left, another, 
It must have been 15, 20 minutes left when that it went is. in. It, you know, it wasn't, the game wasn't over. Here's Koku. Five out with a flick on. Van Nistelrooy looked to turn. Good defending though by Hart. Roy Keane gets in the way of Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank. Van Bommel's cross. Cleared by Dunn. Koku. Shaping to shoot. Van Nistelrooy. Rude Van Nistelrooy. Somehow blocked. Van Hooydonk across. And into the side. By Kluivert. Another golden opportunity missed by one of the golden boys of the Dutch team. Well, Van Nistelrooy is brilliant here. Great save. I think it was by Dunn, but I don't think Kluivert can believe that. He's just got foot, just caught the inside of his foot around the post. I think a lot of supporters thought that was in. Hasselbank. Van Nistelrooy! My word, they were covering their eyes here then for an agonising moment. It looked like that was going in. Well, this, this is an unbelievable header. I don't think Shea given it a hope if it had been on target. Van Bommel. Hoffman. They're imploring the referee to blow the final whistle. Melchior. Van Bronckhorst, cleared by Dan, and that's it, and Ireland have done it. They have pulled off a famous victory here, despite being down to ten men in the second half after the sending off of Gary Kelly. Mick McCarthy's side have won it, thanks to Jason McAteer's goal. You enjoy it on the pitch, the players enjoy it on the pitch, I enjoy it on the pitch, then you come in, and you know there's still work to be done. So yeah, it listens. Nice feeling, happy dressing room, there's a lot of banter going on in there. But we'd not qualified for the World Cup. And I think we all knew there was still a good bit of work. I don't know what I said. I don't, it's difficult because I usually come in maybe two or three or four or five minutes after them all. They've sat down, Ian Evans Taffler said something, I know he will, uh, and had a chat with one or two of them. I'll come in. It's usually, well done, thanks, good luck. Whatever you're saying at that stage, there might have been a couple of, I certainly had words for Gary Kelly, having been sent off, he was feeling awful, but, you know, we'd qualified, so there was some words for him. But it, I would have said it was, it was surprisingly, you'd think, we would be, it was quite calm. And I, I looked around, there were tired bodies, battered and bruised, there was bags of ice everywhere, and treatment being administered from physios and doctors checking. So it was a very, it's almost like a business-like, <laughs> no, it's atmosphere in there. They've all got games to go to as well after that for the clubs. But it was an epic win, and a big victory for Portugal in Andorra meant the Dutch were out of it. A playoff place was assured for the Irish, but even then the boss never considered winning the group. The winning of it, you know, you don't even think about that, because Portugal to, to lose to Estonia at home. I said, I've, I've, got a, I've got a mate, a Portuguese pal, and I said, you must be, you know, you must have a big cigar on, you must have the champagne out, because you'll, you'll not get beat. No way is it, is it going to happen. And we're not going to beat Cyprus by seven, eight, nine. It, obviously, if Portugal score one, we have to score eight or something. It just wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. Cyprus are a decent side. And I think the fact that they didn't send their strongest team, I think there were three or four players missing, uh, I think that caused a bit of a stir in Portugal as well. They gave them something else to whinge about. But uh, we were never going to win by seven, eight, nine goals. And it, it panned out as expected. The doorway was by Beskalakis. It's going to be in Hart. 1 0. What a start for Ireland in the third minute. On a day when it was thought they may have to be patient, Ireland have got a dream opening here. Well, what a super strike this is for Ian Hart. The goalkeeper's got no hope and he hasn't even moved for it. It's right in the corner. Absolutely brilliant. 
Kennedy. Clearance by Sachas to Hart. This is Keane. And Quinn is on the end of it! And he has done it! On his 35th birthday, Niall Quinn makes it a double celebration by becoming the Republic of Ireland's record goal scorer. Happy birthday, Niall, and no one will be more delighted for him than the man from whom he's taken the record, one Frank Stapleton. Well, well done, Niall, I've got to say. As soon as Kevin Kilbane got that ball, he just pulled off his defender's shoulder, and it was always a goal as soon as it came in. And that's what he's done all his career. Fantastic goal, and congratulations. I was thrilled for him. I was delighted he got the record. You know, it couldn't happen to a, to a nicer guy, better professional. Uh, and somebody who's been a huge help to me in terms of me doing my job, you know. Uh, yeah, so please, I think it was his birthday as well. So uh, he had a full house, didn't he? It was great for him. I was, I was, I was, I was delighted. He stood by me when, I, as I said earlier, that team came to an end, and it would have been very easy for him to bring in somebody young and, and nurse them through, like he did one or two of the others. Um, thankfully, he kept he, he kept by me, and he, he stood by me, and he. He kept playing me, I was getting injuries here, left, right and centre, but he stuck me in every now and then and when I was fit and I got the odd goal here and there and I got, ended up getting the record, so you know, a lot to be grateful to him for. And I scored far more goals um, for Mick in the amount of games than I did under Jack, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just really suited me great to be involved with Mick for the last four or five years. And here's Gary Breed. Roy Key. Now Yasumi with the opportunity for Cyprus and he's hit and hoped and he's produced an excellent save from Shea Given. This is a tremendous effort. This must be all of 40 yards out. What a strike. I think it was going in. It's a good save. You have to make sure. And then has got the ball across. Kilban linking up with Quinn. It's Kevin Kilban. Good save. Meanwhile, there have been developments in the match in Lisbon. Portugal against Estonia, and Portugal have taken the lead. Jao Pinto has scored for Oliveira's team, and they lead by a goal to nil, which, as it stands, puts Portugal back to the top of the table by virtue of their superior goal difference. Had uh, spotted something in there. Was it a handball, possibly? Well, if this if this hit David Connolly, oh, it was handball. He did stick his hand out. Unfortunately, a good pick up from the referee because the ball was moving about. Yeah, it's handball. Maybe trouble Ireland to learn that there are further developments in Lisbon, where Portugal were already a goal up against Estonia through João Pinto. Now Nuno Gomez has headed into Estonia's goal to make it 2-0, which means they're matching Ireland's score here, which makes automatic qualification less and less likely, almost impossible now for the Republic of Ireland. Theodutu breaks it up. A frustrating passage of the game at the moment for Ireland, this Okas. As Yasumi waiting in the middle, he's done well! And he hits the side netting. And there's another warning for Ireland. It's going to need a wake-up call here. He's done absolutely brilliant. Past Steve Staunton. And it's just... He's not kept his head. A little chip to the far post and it's an open goal. Quinn's layoff. Here's Kilban. Here's Connolly! His international drought is ended. Ireland celebrates a third goal, and David Connolly celebrates his first international goal since February 1999. Yeah, this is a great move. A lovely ball in by Ian Hart. Great layoff by Nal Quinn. Kevin Kilban. And he just let the ball run across his body. Knew where the goal was. Into the corner. Lovely play. Well done, David Connolly. Not only did he need the goal, but I think Ireland needed a goal at this stage of the game.
Kilban and towards uh, Roy Keane. Here's uh, Roy Keane. It's four. Well, the goal rush is starting now, but has it started too late? 4-0 repeats the scoreline that Ireland achieved in Cyprus. Roy Keane got two that day, and he's got one today. This is a great touch. <clears throat> the central defenders of this. Cyprus just didn't get out. Touch from Roy. Second touch sets it up. The third is past the goalkeeper. So it's well spotted. Very slow coming out. But you've got to take it opportunities. And we've certainly done that now. It's well out of their reach. And the final group table looked like this. The Republic confirming a playoff place, tied on 24 points with Portugal. It was still an achievement, 24 points we finished with level on Portugal, but, you know, cost. Cost is because we didn't score as many goals, but not to score as many goals as Portugal. I think when you look at it, I'd, I'd say, you know, they, they, they just come out of the European Championships, the players that they got, uh, I think to finish on 24 points was the important thing, to be level on there. And if we, I always said, if we fail by not scoring as many goals, then there's not a lot we can do about it. We'd, we'd, I think we'd scored a fair few, just not as many as, uh, as Portugal. After the break, it's those playoffs and the two games against Iran. He's not worried about the press, he's more worried about the fans and the, and the people of Ireland, how they accept him, and I think they accept him re well now. He's overcome, I remember the very start, and forgive me for saying this, uh, I met two ladies, in, uh, older ladies in Dublin airport, and they came over and said to Mick, I know you, don't I, I know you, you've been on TV. And Mick wouldn't give in to her, she went away, she came back, I know who you are now, you're Jack McCarthy, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> he's got there, they're going there, they're going to be in, Ireland's going to be in front of the world, for the next five or six months, and uh, I think they'll do okay. I honestly do. I think they'll do okay. I've seen them play a few times, and it's, he's got a very well, good, young, balanced side. He's one of the best players in the world, and Roy Keane, of course. One major development before the first leg against Iran: Roy Keane was fit to start, and he had been inspirational throughout the campaign. When Roy turned up, uh, he, and you know, I was quite happy for him to come in for the game. He came on Wednesday or Thursday, I think Thursday, and uh, he said to me, "If the game had been the week before, he wouldn't have played. Even though the game had been at the beginning of that week, he wouldn't have played because of the way his knee felt. So, when you consider that fact, then there was a, a possibility he might not have played in either game." I ran tricky fixture. We, we didn't know what to expect as players, but Mick himself then going out with Ian Evans, doing their homework, coming back, showing us little bits of video, talking to us, um, I think that was absolutely crucial. And uh, it was a difficult game, and you know, the first game in Dublin, uh, I think probably for maybe three quarters of the game, uh, we done very well, uh, we controlled the game, we got our two goals, and then suddenly they changed the game from having a wing back they played very defensive, changing and putting another guy on that went really out and attacked us. They took the game to us. Two playoff defeats under Mick only added to the nerves for the Irish. Andy Gray and Rob Hawthorn describe the action. Finnan. McAteer. Goalkeeper thought about coming in, didn't it? Robbie Keane! And straight into the goalkeeper's hands. Didn't quite come for him. I wondered about Quinny, would he go for goal? Would he look for Robbie Keane? They back off Quinn. Unbelievably here. Niall Quinn, eight yards, nine yards, free header. He's so unlucky, Robbie Keane. Just didn't get the power that he required. Ian Hart. Played low this time. Quinn gets down, storms in! Oh, well done, goalkeeper. Well done. 
That was a brave piece of goalkeeper, I have to say. Holland looks for McAteer, it was a bit short, he's done well to rescue it, and he's gone down as a penalty! McAteer, taken down, gets the award of the kick. I'm looking at the defender, I'm looking at his action as he gets up, and it's one of, he's resigned to, he made the tackle, he jumps in there and doesn't really get it, but it's this one here, and you can see he takes the trailing leg of Jason McAteer. Really rash challenge, uncalled for, he's not really going anywhere. Now can Ian Hart do his job? The trusted penalty taker of Ireland. What do you think? Straight down the middle. Power. I wonder. Well, with the sort of performance that Iranian goalkeepers having, who knows what might happen here? It's Ian Hart, and it's one nil Ireland. Lansdowne Road erupts as Ireland get that crucial first goal. What a coolly taken penalty by Ian Hart. Well, it's been a long time coming, Rob, but well worth waiting for. It's a precious situation. Needs a cool head. Ian Hart had that wonderful penalty. It's McAteer who takes it this time. Robbie Keane, yes! His international drought is ended in thumping good fashion. A spectacular finish from Robbie Keane, his first international goal in 14 months, and what a time to score it. And what a big goal it might be, Rob. It might be the goal that takes Ireland all the way to Japan and Korea. Roy Keane, Finnan, McAteer, Kilban, and he's launched it. Good take. Lovely football. One touch and Holland gets it across. It's Kevin Kilburn on the turn. That's right. That's where he did it. He's there. Lovely football again. Well, can life get any uh, sweeter for Leeds United at the moment? Top of the Premiership. Uh, oh, here's a chance. It's Karimi who's through. And well done, Shea Given. When called upon for the first real time in this match, he was there and did his job. Ali Karimi, who is the danger, gets away again. And tucks inside Gary Breen. And he's got through! Oh, and a, another magnificent stop! Here's a possibility of an opening, and Iran looked the gift horse in the mouth. Kenny Cunningham keeping a watchful eye on Ali Dai, and the Republic of Ireland will take a two-goal lead to the hostile environment of Tehran for the second leg of their World Cup playoff. Ian Hart scoring from the penalty spot before half-time and after the break Mick McCarthy's team extended their lead thanks to Robbie Keane's first international goal for 14 months. A couple of incidents in that game, Shea gave him a two fantastic saves and to go to Iran 2-0 as opposed to 2-1 was a huge boost for us. That was the game I think that uh, proved to a lot of people in Ireland that, that uh, against Shea uh, was the main man. It's lovely when a goalkeeper comes off the pitch and you could say that we would have been beaten only for him but the saves he had that day, especially the second save, I thought it was a fantastic one. Over the whole course of the, the tournament or the, the qualifying stage, I think we only lost five goals uh, and that's a credit to Shea, Alan Kelly also and Dean Carley because the important thing with that group is that they all work together and they work during the week and uh, all I have to do is sort of give them quality talk to him a bit about the psychology side of it and those, those three guys work extremely well but Shea now is he's matured into a very very good accomplished goalkeeper
he's much stronger physically. He's also much stronger mentally because he was always very, very hard on himself, I felt, when he was young. Wanted to be there, wanted to get there before actually maybe he was ready to go there, to be the best in the world. Now he's got the opportunity in a World Cup to go out there and show and carry on from what he's been doing. So to Tehran and the Azadi Stadium with 120,000 waiting to pay their respects. It wasn't over, as, as, as it was proved, and of course of Iran's home record, how you know, they play at home, the, the, the atmosphere. I wouldn't say it, it could be intimidating. I don't think for a minute it intimidated my players and the team. They didn't uh, put us under any pressure whatsoever. You know, people expect you to go to the airport and there's going to be people there and they're going to put all sorts of pressure on you. Maybe not getting your luggage and maybe not getting there to the hotel in time, but everything ran really smoothly. And the hotel itself, they, they were great in there. Only when we got to the game did we find out the true passion of the Iranians. Uh, they were there from half one, the game was at half five, and uh, they really, really were very, very uh, uh, boisterous indeed. And um, we walked in and we had to go in underneath the stand in case because we were throwing things and they were, they were just going crazy. Uh, male testosterone, people were saying <laughs> at the game, no drink, of course. Uh, but we got into, into the dress room and uh, we decided, right, are we going to stay in here or are we going to go to the pitch? and we decided we're going to go onto the pitch. And I think it was the right thing to do, and it was sort of an hour and a half, three quarters before the game. We went out there, we got all the abuse from them verbally, uh, and eventually that sort of died the thing down a little bit because it wasn't even half as bad when we, we took the pitch just right before the game. A significant point was that Roy couldn't play because his, his knee was troubling from the first game. Uh, and of course people say, oh, what can you do without Roy Keane? And, and of course I prefer not to talk about him if he's not there, talk about the lads who are playing. And uh, the two, Matty Holland and, and Mark Kinsler, are fantastic players for us. And uh, I thought, on top of everything else, that was just another pleasing point, that we went there without, you know, without Roy, without the captain, and played as well as we did, and as controlled and as mature performance as it was. Again, different tactics. We had to sort of not go mad. Uh, in Dublin a little bit, we went maybe for our third goal and we exposed ourselves a little bit. But out there, we always knew that we could sort of uh, take the ball to them, but with a little bit of caution. And I think it worked very well. Our defence played well on the night. I just felt from the Iranians' point of view that they just didn't have that total commitment that they were going to feel that they were going to go and win the game. And it was only until the last couple of seconds when, when they had scored a goal that they were running around a bit frantic. But up until that, it was quite easy. The goal, deep in injury time, meant Irish hearts were in their mouths suddenly. But then the final whistle and the celebrations could begin. Albeit in a rather unusual setting. It was a strange, strange feeling. We're on, we're on, we're away from home. We've got a small section of fans. Can't hear them. No chance. The noise that was going off, firecrackers, bangers, bombs, stuff had been thrown that set the stadium alight. It was an incredible atmosphere to the last 15 minutes. Uh, I was being followed by a posse of cameramen and. Uh, TV and, and photographers and trying to get around just to see all the players but always all around me were these guys from FIFA and Iranian FA or you know people security guys telling me that I have to go up to this press conference and I can't go back to the dressing room after this press conference and I have to be honest you know I wasn't happy and, and you're trying to enjoy it but there's this all wanting a piece of you which is it's great because we've qualified and I've had the other side when you walk off and nobody wants a piece of you, so that's, I, I know which I prefer. But the reality is you want to be with the lads, with the players, with the staff and, and enjoy it. So I, I think I got down to see most of them. But always, this is, this is can I tell you, I've, I've got to go to this press conference, which is driving me mad. And so the players went off the pitch and, and I'm hanging around, I have to go to this press conference, which was one of the most bizarre press conferences I've ever been in. They were fighting in a heap at the back of it. There was all sorts of... And I was sat there, but what was lovely, I was sat there, completely chilled, absolutely, you know, buzzing. We just, we just qualified for the World Cup. So nothing was going to upset me until after I'd been in there about 10 minutes and they were still scrapping in a heap at the back of the press conference. And I said, look, lads, if this doesn't start in a minute, I'd love to be with my players, I'm going to leave. So it started. 
It was just, it was, it was strange. We went through the, you know, the experience of losing a couple of playoffs before under Mick, and uh, nobody, nobody wanted to go through that again. And Mick himself, as he says himself, I think he lost about three or four pounds. Would worry without letting that come across to the players just on his own when we talk privately and that you know I think he was he was very very nervous himself and uh, we did not want to go through that feeling of disappointment again so it was really utter relief and uh, I think it also showed a real commitment together everybody we were out there without Roy Keaton Stephen Carr is an exceptional player um, up front Damien Duff was missing uh, Mark Kenny, so we're missing quite good players, but the group that went out there showed a real collective and team spirit, and I think the, all that emotion poured out at the end. But talking to the to the TV afterwards, it was yeah, a lot of emotions going through my head. There, I have to be honest, there's uh, the fact that the pressure, the relief, you know, so many emotions going around in your head. Uh, I have to be honest. Uh, I thought about my old fella, who, who died in the march before the Cyprus game, and, and I thought about Fiona and my kids, and he sta I started to mention them, of course, and I know how much it would mean to them. And uh, yeah, the uh, I think I said on TV, the tough guy, gone soft for a while. It's the way we are, mate. You know this this hard thing that you put on on the pitch, and and afterwards we're all. It was very emotional. It, it was wonderful. It really was. So mission accomplished. Germany, Saudi Arabia and Cameroon came out of the hat at the draw. Another unique experience. I'd been around Japan and, and Korea looking at different things and I don't think the penny had dropped even still. That we were, you know, the World Cup and what it was about, what, that we were going. Uh, but when I got to the draw and you see other managers, coaches, associations milling around the place and it's the, the pomp and the ceremony and the hype. Started to think about it and then the... It must have been the longest draw ever. Uh, plenty of singing and dancing. <laughs> plenty of singing and dancing. We'd gone through the full range of music, opera. Uh, great Anastasia was there, though. That was nice of her to come and see me. I thought that was wonderful. That was a surprise. <laughs> but, it, but even that was in the half time. That was between the first half of the draw and the second half. I mean, they just it was so... It was just dragged True. out, you know. And... Uh, at one stage, I remember saying, "Who are we going to play? <laughs> I want to know who we're going to play." But the start of it, when it came on and they played the anthem that will be the anthem, you know, before all the World Cup games, the World Cup anthem, and we saw the flags coming down. The kids, the youngsters, with the flags, the penny dropped then, and uh, a bit like the Holland game, hairs on the neck and the uh, the lump in the throat. Seeing our flag, the tricolour, come down, knowing that we were in there. 31 other flags, that was brilliant. And I had a smile on my face from then on. It was, it was, I was like the kid in a sweet shop, it was brilliant. We've got as good a chance as any. Uh, if you look at the, the group we've came through, you never, no one would have believed the Dutch would have been knocked out at this stage, would they? They'd have been one of the favourites uh, for the World Cup itself. So that shows you we have got strength and depth in our squad. And I don't think we actually fear anyone. In Ireland at the moment, uh, people are expecting us to go through the next phase quite easily. And, and it, we have to dampen that down a little bit because we're up against a team Cameroon in the very first game at half three in the afternoon, which could be difficult condition-wise. Uh, they are the, the African champions. Uh, they have been in the last four World Cups. We don't know a lot about them just yet, but we will find out. Um, but uh, that won't be an easy game. They're big and strong, and they can be an exceptional team on the day. Uh, the last World Cup, I think, they weren't as good and they lost their discipline a little bit. But it all depends on the start that they get now. It's the first game also. And you want to be able to go into this tournament at least not losing the first game because then it gives you a real chance. Saudi Arabia, again, I think I read in the paper today that they've scored the most goals of any other team in the 32 teams. Uh, so they have, they, they'll go in there with confidence also. And then the Germans, you know. Uh, <laughs> People have talked about them now, they've lost their edge and they're not as good as they were or not, but the Germans are Germans and they will go out there, big, physically strong team who will grind away at results and they proved in the playoff game, I think, against Ukraine that they're not finished by any means. We've got a decent draw. People have made a lot of it, you know. Germany, since when did they become a bad side, Germany? All right, so England beat them 5-1, but they spanked the Ukraine in the playoffs. Cameroon, fifth World Cup, they've got, somebody tells me, eight players playing in the Champions League. And Saudi beat Iran. We know how good Iran were. So, could have been a lot worse. But I think it's a favourable draw. 
And uh, of course, I had a big smile on my face having been there, and everybody tends to think it was because of the draw that we got. But it wasn't. It was, it was just being there. That that sort of worked out. It was a favourable draw. Everything slotted into place in where we're going to stay, training camps, travelling. It, it just worked out really well. So it was a, it was a good night. I think that the Irish must only be second in people who have Irish parentage to the Chinese in population throughout the world. Because they always turn up in vast numbers. And it uh, always very well behaved, never cause any trouble. They want to sing, not fight. I remember the matches in, in, in Italy and in Sicily in, in 1990. Uh, we went into um, one of the matches, uh, I think it was first or second match, and you know, huge security. Um, people armed to the teeth with the machine guns and the dogs, you know, heading out for a war or something else. Um, and by the end of the match, they, you know, they're, they're, they're taking photographs with the Irish supporters, uh, with, with you know, Irish colours on them and all of the banter. So I think the Irish travel and support, even though I would biasly say, but I think it's true, they've travelled in huge numbers for a small country all over the world. Uh, we've built, made friends uh, and, and uh, no enemies. Uh, and I think there's a huge appreciation for that. They, they love their game, but they're able to take defeat and they, they, they're huge ambassadors for the country and huge ambassadors I think for Irish culture which is a bit of fun, a bit of sport, a bit of crack. Uh, the match is important but it's not the end of the world. Geographically it's difficult. Climatic conditions will be extreme I think. Temperatures and uh, having got there, time difference, I found such a difficulty in, in, in adjusting to it. Uh, the, uh, not only the heat but the uh, the travelling in between times, I think it's going to, that is going to be difficult, and I think for European team teams to do well, it's it's going to be difficult. That all said, though, we're not, we, I'm not happy that we've just qualified. I'm not happy that oh great we've got out, you know. And there's this bunch of Irish tourists going over there to enjoy the World Cup and 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 not to worry about winning it. We want to do as well as we can, and in doing that, we want to qualify from the group. Uh, and I don't think anybody, certainly none of the players, will be just going there as a bunch of tourists there for three games. We'll be wanting to qualify. We want to get as many points as we can. Wouldn't it be great to have another unbeaten run like we've just had and, and qualify for the next stage? And of course I've looked at it. I mean, well, it was, it was asked of me immediately afterwards rather than looking at it. I think if we, if we should win our group, we play the second team out of the Spanish group. And if we finish second, and we'd play the winner, which you'd expect to be Spain. And that's in Korea. So that's our goal. May it be the shadows call will fly away. May it be you journey.